Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. Appreciate you joining us for the ERISA webinar and virtual education series. Uh, we have a panel today that is power packed that's going to tell us about best practices when uh, using and talking about geo, the geo and geospatial data governance. I am your moderator today, and I am Trisha Brush. I'm the Director of Information Systems and Analytics. I'm with Planning and Development Services of Kenton County. I'm in Kentucky, uh, Covington, Kentucky today, and coming to you um, just right across the river, Ohio River, for, uh, from the beautiful downtown Cincinnati, Ohio. This is our list of panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. And I would love to introduce them to you today. First off, we have Dina Cross. She's the principal consultant, head of executive engagement for Esri. She's coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Then we have Deepti Concha, and she is the principal executive consultant and practice leader for global development and humanitarian sector. She's also with Esri, joining Dina and she'll be coming from DC. We have Isabella Miller. She's the Director of Information Technology and Leadership Development. She's with Greater Salt Lake Municipal Services District. She's joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah. We have Pete Watt Croswell joining us from Frankfort, Kentucky. He is the President of Croswell Schulte IT Consultants. Uh, also up, we have Dr. Amy Rock, and she is the Executive Director of the University Consortium of Geographic Information Science. She's from uh, Iraq, uh, California. And then also joining us is Jarrell Brown. He's the Head of Analytics and Business Intelligence from the Henry Ford, and that he's coming to us from Detroit, Michigan. Joining us also is Paul Giroux. He's the founder the maturity model method and developer of Slim Jim, Slim DNA, advocate for enterprise maturity. He's the president of the Mass Maturity Inc. and joining us from Ontario, Canada. And then next up will be Nathan Hazelwood. He is the principal consultant, GIS Business Consulting, Eagle Technology, and he is joining us from Auckland, New Zealand. A few logistics about this webinar today. Uh, this is a 90 minute webinar. We have seven presentations. They are 10 minutes each. We are asking that questions be answered or will be answered at the end of the webinar. We're asking you to put questions into the Q&A tab. Uh, thank you to Pete Croswell and Croswell Schulte IT Consultants. He's giving away to five random attendees a copy of his GIS management book and this will happen throughout the webinar. Thank you for spending the afternoon with us. We know that there are many definitions that make up uh, geospatial governance. And so we have settled on this one today and it comes from a source from LinkedIn community. It is geospatial data governance is the set of policies, standards, roles, and processes that guide the creation, the collection, storage, sharing, and use of geospatial data within an organization or a network of stakeholders. It ensures that geospatial data is accurate, reliable, timely, and compliant with legal and ethical requirements. It also enables collaboration, coordination, and communication among different users and providers of geospatial data. So first up uh, that we'll be presenting you is Dina and Deepti. So I'm going to stop sharing and kick it over to them so they can launch their slides. Dina and Deepti. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And as Deepti is putting up the slides, and uh, for the sake of time, I will start um, start us as we go. I think you'll like uh, what we have to share, all of the participants, and it's going to be an exciting session. Um, first of all, let's go into just just brief introductions. Trish has been able to uh, introduce us, but we here at Esri like often to work as a team of two. So we are presenting 
together, we, uh, DP and myself, um, as Trisha said, I head up our executive consulting group globally, and we focus on uh, strategy, governance, as well as organizational optimization. We, in addition to consulting, we also do um, executive coaching. Um, I'm coming in uh, from Atlanta, Georgia. I just saw someone else from Georgia. And quick introductions from DD. You may be on mute. All right, we have a question for you as we get started. Um, as um, the our session goals overall, and then in are to just launch us um, and in terms of what's important and why is it important to have data governance and organizational governance. We often do the work um, side by side. We're gonna next speak through creating a data charter and policies. It's important to start with the end in mind and to be very clear on how you address this topic. DeepT will dive more deeply into the data life cycle. She has some great information there, and I'll conclude with the benefits of data governance. As you look at the next slide, we'll walk you through um, next what we're actually rolling out globally, which is what we call geotransformation. What we find is the most successful organizations, as they think about elevating the impact of their GIS program, tie together governance, these processes that ensure efficiency and use of the information technology and location intelligence, including data, strategy, which is the, the guiding North Star, this is your vision and direction for your overall program and align it with adoption. That's ability to transform the organization in the most optimal way. Next, as we look into the elements, we often take a holistic view um, that's very complementary to what Trisha just shared with us and it is enabling that organization to achieve its goals. So you may say, how do you do that? Well, we start first of all with the overall objectives, the purpose, which we'll dive into with the charter, of course, process, people, performance, aligned again with the overall governance model and framework. And that's comprised of these, what we call our pillars, that's business, governance, system, engagement, and capacity. These pillars alongside the objectives marry up to provide an optimal approach. Next, as we move into, uh, many of you have probably seen this, but we really like to think about it holistically, like I said. And as you look at the system of engagement, the system of record and system of insights, we view this all together as a system of systems. And the best organizations, you know, as GIS changes and you move through being able to optimize your investment, it's important to be able to build trust. It's important to establish ownership and accountability. We also understand the need to protect your IP. Those specific data sets or the way that you offer your services to whether it's a government organization or a private sector organization. The necessity of security to secure your assets and then overall to provide that guidance on best practices and standards as you manage and grow and change and add flexibility into the system of systems, it's important to govern it all. Next, as we think about the overarching way that we structure it, um, I'll share with you just briefly um, a way to look at it and uh, 
move forward uh, deeply, I think you're going to um, talk about particularly how you establish the charter and overall govern your program. Over to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Tina. Sorry, I was having some Zoom challenges earlier, so couldn't speak up, unmute myself. Uh, so I'm back. <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, in powering through it. So, so going into beyond what uh, Dina was just saying, so when we look at governance, it's a holistic approach. So we think about governance as a full program governance in GIS and then drilling down from it. So we're looking at governance, whether it is data or anything that you're governing in your GIS program. You have to think about strategic governance, which is looking at your executive committees, your steering committees, which are in the management tier and senior management tier, and then operational governance, which is really looking at your working groups, your community of practices, and really providing direction coming all the way from the strategic tier down to the operational side, and then doing the execution in the operational side, and then leading to some controls that get placed based on those policies, based on those practices, to provide a full governance framework for your organization. Uh, that is creating uh, ownership, accountability, and trust in your organization that Dina mentioned earlier. And really the, the key function of the executive committee is to provide that oversight, provide those policies and, and, and resource allocation. In the middle management, it is really about the planning and initiative prioritization and uh, resource uh, uh, utilization. And in operational tier, of course, it's the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance and management of your work. So when you look at the governance, we, as Dina mentioned, we think about it in, the, in terms of five pillars. And where we look at the data governance, it really sits in the system systems part where it is uh, looked at from uh, architecture, security, data information products, your automation integration of data with other systems, your reporting and analytics you're doing, your web access, your business continuity, and so on. And uh, you can see different colors here. Uh, it's in the order of priority that our customers have asked us to like help them assess their governance. Uh, and uh, most of the time people come to us talking to us about system governance and that's where most of their challenges are. But I always emphasize and Dina and I kind of uh, take this approach is take it a holistic approach. Do not just narrow your view on data and systems. Take a full holistic approach because in order for anything to be successful in technology, you have to take people and processes in play in, in consideration. Um, so I just for uh, posterity, uh, data governance is really set of rules, policies, and practices an organization will follow to ensure that data is safe, it's accessible, and it's just trustworthy. And there is a lot of confusion in our customer base. So I just want to clarify this for everybody that data governance and data management are not one and same thing. While governance focuses on the policies and procedures and the people and the roles and responsibilities and your data catalog, where data management is really focused on the technology uh, aspect of it as to like who has access, the, what system is being used, uh, how you are say, uh, versioning your data or what versions of technology you're using to do it. Um, and so when you go back to looking at the, uh, the, the organization, you have to send the data charter. What is your uh, charter? What is the objective? How often are you meeting? Who are the chairs of that? Who are the members of that uh, committee? Uh, what is the purpose of this committee? And then what are the standard agenda for this committee? So that you are discussing your high priority data objectives, business needs, and how data is aligning with it. Um, and those, uh, this committee would drive the direction of how data is utilized and managed across the organization as a whole. So in addition to the charter, we also think about data policies and there are so many different data policies that you could be thinking about. I'm highlighting 13 here, and of which I just want to highlight a few here, which really make it very important for us to consider for any data set. What are the roles and responsibility policies? Like who owns what data set? What are naming standards and uh, for your data sets? Uh, what are your metadata policy? How are you documenting any of and all of your data? Uh, how you are doing data classification? Because key to security of the data is classification of the data. 
Also understanding the data quality policies as to how good is good for your organization that you can make decisions based on. And then privacy and privacy and security again is like, do you have to store and manage this data in a certain secure way so that it is only accessible to the people who need to know? So, and it, that creates fit for purpose for your data. Why is all of this so important? The data that we are managing in GIS is getting very complex. These are just a few examples of architectures for data for organizations that we have seen in, with our work with our customers. And more and more, it's getting even more complex as the way the data comes into your organization is evolving through sensors, through field data collection, through active data collection and passive data collection. And all of this is becoming increasingly uh, important for your organization to use for uh, driving the business and also operations of your organization. So the way we think about managing the data is managing the data through its life cycle. From its creation to its storage, the processing you would do, how it is used, it's archived and it's disposed. So uh, when you think about this uh, creation of the data, it could be data that you are acquiring from other organization or data you're actively collecting and managing. As uh, in when data is in that phase, when in initial creation, if you would, it is in the raw form. And as it moves through the life cycle and it gets processed and managed and documented well, it is getting more refined because it's well documented and it has policies and processes implemented on it. And as when you're done with all of those standardization, documentation, and you are ready to roll it out to your users and it's ready for usage, that's its business considered business ready data. That means you can use this data for making decisions on it. So it goes from a planned to in development to an existing phase in your organization. When you look at this data, and we talked about policies before, when you are getting some data in, a candidate data set in, in your organization, you're evaluating, you're in, uh, uh, assessing it. At that time, you're thinking about the policies, uh, about ownership and stewardship. When you are ready to deploy, you have to think about custodian ship policies which are on storage availability and accessibility. So this is how you would manage data through its life cycle, creating using policies to manage it for its various security and access controls. So I'm going to hand over to Dina to talk about the benefits of data governance. Absolutely, and we we do regular. Um workshops, uh, webinars, that sort of thing. So please reach out to DP myself as, as you want to learn more. Uh, but the key areas here, like, like DP shared, the governance team and establishing those roles and responsibilities. Next is the policies and practices, data catalog, inventory, the data lifecycle, tool structures, and technology. And we'll wrap up. Uh, we know we're over time. So thank you so much again for allowing us this time to be here. We, we really appreciate it. Reach out as, as you can. We look forward to the rest of the, the webinar. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much, Dina and Deepti. We really appreciate you being here today and what a, so much information it packed into those slides. Next we have Isabella Miller. So uh, we'll stop sharing from our first group and then uh, we'll get Isabella, uh, get her slides up so that she can start sharing. I believe that we also have a, um, Danielle was gonna put up a poll so we could figure out who who's here in the audience today. What are what are your roles and kind of get a better feel for uh, who's, who's here at the webinar today. Looks like the poll is open, so please go ahead and uh, choose. We have 30 seconds to choose your role. That'll help us understand who we have here today. I'm going to kick it on over to Isabella. So Isabella, you're up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Isabella Miller. I am Director of the Information Technology for the Greater Salt Lake Municipal Services District. 
Um, my, most of my experience comes in the local government. I started back in 2006 as an intern. And over the span of my career, I grew all the way to the uh, upper leadership. Um, today, I want to cover um, four aspects of what I believe is um, required to create a successful um, data governance organization or group. And um, so let's start with that. Before we go deeper into the um, to presentation, I would like you to take a second and really honestly answer the question that you see on the screen and just keep it to yourself. Um, because this is this keeping the answer in your head really will help you to figure out what the next steps are. Okay, with that being said, let's talk about the strategy. Um, so usually the strategy of setting up the data governance and information in your organization happens because you encounter an issue. Um, either you have, uh, for example, the GIS group, user group is growing in your organization and there is so much data now, there's confusion. What, uh, who owns the data? What is shareable, right? So what, one of the way of dealing with it is to go through those three questions then you see on the slides and then you'll get the slides later on as well. And hoping that this will bring you the clarity of what really is the problem and how you're going to overcome it and what the resources and policies you need to put in place. And all of that will come to the solution uh, or help you to create the data governance that will tackle that issue, right? So it will provide you the solution. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, most of my career was in the local government. So I started in the county government. We had about um, 6,000 employees. And at the time when I was there in the county, we had about 40 JS professionals and 35% of the 6,000 employees were the GIS users, right? So the way how the county structure, the, um, the data governance, so we starting with it, is the overarching this, um, GIS steering committee and a couple working groups and the GIS policy. So let me go over that very quickly. So the GA steering committee is, is responsible to setting up the vision, the mission, and the budget, and oversee um, the budget of the GIS in the in the county, and it encompasses elected officials and department department heads. So it's the upper leadership. The next one um, was the, the the creation of this, as we call it, STWIC, the GIS Solution and Technology Working Group. And the reason why that was created, because originally IT war made the recommendations to the steering committee, but as the GIS um, grew within the county, we had more and more GIS professionals from different departments, and, and we felt like they should have a say as well what the GIS should look like within the county government, right? So, this, so the, that working group was created, and their main purpose was to... Um, develop the strategy, set the goals for the uh, given year, and also provide the training. So that organization, that working group was oversaw, but uh, over is is overseen by either the somebody from the mayor's portfolio or elected office, and encompasses GIS professionals and the IT group. Next, um, that was shortly after I left the county. The data governance working group was created, and it's very similar to the STWIC when you um, have a very similar uh, attendees or participants and the, the responsibility of training, setting the guidance, and then keeping up the data inventory. As the GIS grows in the organization, those things are also important. And lastly was the GIS policy. So a um, few years ago, when I left the county, I went to work on the district, and you can see how different the the structure of the district government is, right? We uh, have 100 employees, so it's much different than the 6,000 employees the county has. Out of the 100 employees, we have uh, five, G five GIS professionals, but 80% of our organizations are GIS users, which um, it's it's we are very very happy about it. Um, we, but it does provides it provides its own challenges, right? So the way how we structure our governance, we have the ITGS department, um, that is my group. We have um, ITGS user group, 
And also we have the GIS policy. So let me go over that very quickly as well. So the IT GIS um, department um, that is led by me and I'm work very closely with the GIS and IT professionals and we are the responsible one to set up the vision and the mission in our organization. And we also make the recommendations to the budget um, to, to our upper leadership. Um, the next one is we do bi-monthly GIS um, IT user group when it's it's not just the GIS and IT professionals who are the leading um, individuals of it, but we also invite GIS users to showcase how they, um, not being GIS professionals, are utilizing GIS in our organization. So we found that very beneficial for other people who are maybe not as comfortable as using GIS or understanding the data, understanding the principle, the governance of that. So that, that kind of helps us to close the gap. So the main reason why we set up the user group is to guide, to share the best practices and to train the um, either existing professionals, the GIS users or the newcomers. And then the GIS policy, a um, couple years ago, we decided we need, as our um, GIS usage, usage group, users group grew, we decided it was important to put some kind of policy in place that govern governance, govern the, um, the usage of the GIS, right? So the policy's main purpose is to guide, set best practices and the structure over um, the growing GIS um, usage in our organization. So the leadership together with the GIS professionals, together we worked on that. And then we took it to our board of trustees for um, approval and, and then for um, adoptions of that policy to make that legal. Okay, so throughout this organization, I don't know if you saw there was like a common theme. So there are three different audiences that we're talking about. We have the upper leadership, we have the GIS IT professionals, and then we have the users, right? Most of the time, what I notice in my career there is, we don't talk the same language. And because we don't talk the same language, we often have to have some kind of translator that we introduce to our organization, okay? So next well, next thing what I wanna share with you is why we even talking about data governance today. In my opinion, there are pros and cons like to everything, right? Main one is to develop the common language, language that is understood through all three different audiences and other people than I, than I may, maybe forgot to mention. Um, make sure to we we the purpose is to make sure we share the da high data quality, and we have a clarity on what we can and cannot share. We understand that there is a never-ending story. You think you finish with something and then you have to start over again, right? So it's hard, it's time consuming, it's hard to track and so forth. So I wanna leave you today with some tips and tricks from my experience on how to set up the data governance in local government. Understanding your why and why now, right? Knowing why do you need to do it and what change in your organization than you actually now thinking about it. Getting the buy-ins. Um, one of the mistakes I made early on in my in my career is like, I thought I was invincible. So I was like, I'm just going to set the data governance and I fell short. Then I had to start over again and I had to go and get the buy-ins. I talked to other leadership, to other GIS users, to IT professionals, because what I thought in my head made sense, it really didn't for everybody else. So I hope you found that useful. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Isabella. That was so insightful. And I love that you shared your, your uh, story about, um, you know, trying to kind of go in it alone. And then uh, you really needed to reach out and get the leadership's buy-in. So thank you for sharing that. Just as a reminder, uh, so up next, we've got Pete Croswell. He's join us, joining us by phone. And so I'm going to, I've got a slide deck here and I'm going to launch the slides. Just as a reminder, please put questions into the Q&A tab. That is, uh, we're gonna take questions at the very end. So thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna switch it on over to Pete 
And now, Pete, you can take it away. Tricia, thank you very much. And sorry for my technical problems today. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Pete Croswell, and I've been in the GIS field for quite a while. Let's just say it's been over 40 years, and we'll leave it at that. It really started as a manual ink and mylar cartographer in the mid-1970s and then moved up into GIS as the technology matured. Currently, I'm president of Croswell Schulte IT Consultants. Um, I'm working on a wide range of GIS and IT planning and implementation projects for clients in public sector, utilities, and other organizations. I started my GIS career as an analyst and then manager of one of the first statewide GIS programs in the country, in the state of Kentucky. And since 1985, I've been a consultant and also an ad, I'm also an adjunct instructor at Penn State University. Um, I've been a member of uh, ERISA since 1980. It's a great organization as a board member and president, keep active in ERISA program and events. So in keeping with the theme of this webinar, webinar I'm gonna be talking about uh, concepts and practices associated with one aspect of, of geospatial data governance, and that is data quality and data quality management. Trish, go ahead. All right, so first let's define this term quality and particularly focus on uh, the, those definitions from those last three professional organizations and, and uh, standards bodies. And let's go right to the bottom line. Trish, you can advance. Quality is um, defined in, in the context of uh, IT and GIS um, as the degree to which products and results or deliverables um, conform to stated specifications. So that means you got to write down the specifications. Go ahead, Trish. So it's good uh, in crafting standards and parameters for geospatial data quality in your organization to fall back on some of these key standards organizations that define geospatial data specifications and quality parameters and use those as a starting point to define what quality means for your program and your geospatial data. Go ahead, Trisha. So pretty simple so far. You can go to the next one. Another click. All right, so let's uh, let's get into a little bit more detail on this topic of spatial data quality. Go ahead, Tricia. All right, I'd, I'd like to um, define some specific quality parameters drawing on some of those standards developed by um, those uh, standards organizations in the previous slide. You know, first of all, pretty simple adherence to the database um, design that you've created, the feature types, the attribute schema. Second, uh, geographic data coverage, you know, pretty simple, but that has to be clearly stated in, a, in any project for database development. Attribute accuracy, you know, that involves, again, pretty clear the correctness of values that are populated in that attribute schema. Um, and, you know, that gets into things like, you know, the need to set domains, uh, list domains for valid values, range for numeric um, attributes, and those things can be put into quality control procedures for testing that accuracy. Um, completeness of features, uh, positional accuracy, uh, both horizontal and sometimes vertical as well. Currency, sometimes called temporal accuracy and pretty much that comes down to how up to date is your database relative to the standards the specifications that you've set. There are standards that relate to ortho image data quality. The uh, American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing is, is a good uh, source for that. And then other data quality issues that depending on the kind of data you're working with might come into play and things that you need to document well. Go ahead, Tricia. All right, so um, you know, given the fact that data quality means conformance with specifications, again, you've got to document those. And really comes into play in 
two different scenarios. This one here, um, the creation of a new data set, uh, often done by a contractor. So in this case, you see uh, ortho image and LIDAR data collection and processing, but also apply those uh, quality standards and parameters and processes for updating existing uh, data sets, like in this case, a new subdivision and a parcel data set. Go ahead, Trish. All right, so again, you need to document those standards and fit those into database development or update uh, data update procedures in your organization. Okay, Tricia. Um, you can do another click there. So, you know, again, just a picture of uh, ongoing update of your existing data. And, you know, some panelists have, have talked about this as an aspect of governance, but building in quality control steps in that process, usually some quality assurance before posting to a uh, final database. Um, and then developing procedures that address all of those concerns on the right, the, the triggers, sources, responsibilities for update, and then applying those parameters that you've set for uh, database quality. Okay, Trisha. Um, just a little silly little graphic here to say when setting those quality parameters, shoot for high quality, but you know not the highest quality. You don't have the time and the money for 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 perfection. So, you know, pick what makes sense to your organization. Okay. And what business requirements in your organization drive that level of GIS data quality that you need? Okay, Tricia. I just wanted to say quickly some uh, brief thing about these two terms that are thrown around in GIS, uh, quality control and quality assurance. And very often you hear those two together as if they're synonyms. I prefer to differentiate those uh, in a practical sense. Um, quality control, consider a case where you've hired a contractor to do a signed inventory for your municipality. Quality control, both manual and and automated procedures to check quality should be done by that contractor in preparing deliverables. But as a separate step, quality assurance for you as a, as a municipality uh, project team means additional checks on you know, using some automated manual tools to assure that data quality, which results in either acceptance of that data or rejection and going back to the contractor. Okay, Trisha. All right, so again, it all comes down to sort of documenting those parameters and quality specifications. You can go on to the final slide. All right, so just, just a few questions here and topics that we might be able to get to at the end of the uh, webinar after all the panelists have gone, Something, some, some things to, to think about. I'll let you take a quick look at that and then we can move ahead. And I will mention that um, you'll, you saw a few hyperlinks in those slides. I do have some actual documents that help illustrate some of those concepts of documenting data quality specifications and procedures that uh, we can provide to all of the attendees. Okay, and uh, that's it. Thanks everybody. Tricia, I, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you for whoever said that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Pete, for joining us and appreciate all your insights. And I know you had some technical difficulties, but thanks for hanging in there with us. So, um, and appreciate you uh, giving away the five uh, digital books that you have for the GIS hand management hand handout handbook. All right. Next up, we have Dr. Amy Rock. She will be joining us and adding her slides. Amy, you're up. All right, gonna get all my buttons clicked at the same time there. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, hi. So I'm Dr. Amy Rock, and I am the Executive Director of UCGIS, the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science. Um, I also have a faculty role at Cal Poly Humboldt, and uh, I've been faculty at, at uh, a number of other institutes. I saw some folks from Ohio in the chat earlier. I used to teach at Ohio University and Kent State, so shout out there. Um, anyway, I want to talk uh, sort of generally about how we do things at the university, which is a little bit different than uh, some of these other applications that we've seen, but not that different. So um, we have two kind of principal functions with our data sets. And the first one is our teaching roles. We're thinking about things like uh, classroom demos, uh, lab exercises, student projects, things like that, and then uh, research. So uh, faculty researchers, student researchers, collaborative projects, things like that, which results in public, publicly available data, uh, private use data, and then protected data. Uh, we also have some other uses on campus for geospatial data, like facilities management, institutional research, some things like that. But these are kind of the two primary drivers in terms of um, data governance. So for teaching use, we're thinking about uh, data that's been curated for specific activities. So that's, uh, you know, again, demos, labs, uh, maybe tutorials that we have students walking through. Uh, you know, so thinking about where we store this data, um, how we organize it. A lot of times we organize it, organize it by region of coverage rather than uh, data source. But of course, we have to maintain all that provenance with it. Um, we often maintain backups of publicly available data. So even though the student could go out to the internet and get the data for their lab, which we usually encourage them to do, we often maintain a static copy so that it's available if something happens, if that website is down on the day we're teaching lab or uh, you know the, the data has changed. We, have, uh, we use our, our county GIS data for a lot of examples so that we get students familiar with a municipal data set and uh, they made a change a few years ago to the way they code their parcel data, which then meant that none of the questions that we asked them to walk through in lab worked the way we expected them to work. So we had a backup copy. We said, use this. And then we, of course, had to rewrite all of the labs for that. Uh, we also sometimes have to, to pare that data down, either um, because of the size of the data or uh, the scope of the data, because again, these are these are learners, right? These are not geospatial experts. We've got students at various stages along the way from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And so we we oftentimes will take a, a data set and, and pare it down in some way. <clears throat> um, so all of those kinds of things relative to teaching specifically. And then we also think about what we're doing with, with research. So uh, researchers might be collecting, we might be just using public data sets like census data to answer questions. Um, we might be collecting it from private resources. We might have explicit permission to use uh, data from a, from a specific source. We may have, uh, you know, we may have gotten grant, grant funding to help pay for data from a private source. So all of that, we have to maintain the provenance of that data, uh, which is part of good data stewardship as, as alluded to earlier. Um, we also have data generated by the researchers themselves. They might go out and collect data. They might go out and, and um, you know, do a, do a ground truthing of some other data, things like that. Um, and access might be survey data as well. That access might be the researcher. There might be research assistants. There might be funders that demand access. Uh, there might be collaborators. Um, and so who has access to that data can vary by project. Uh, and then, of course, last but not least, we might also have personally identifiable information or confidential information, which have super stringent requirements for storage. So kind of at the end of all this, um, you know, thinking about all of the different uses that we have, the ways that we access the data, um, the ways that we need to store the data, whether it needs to be on a secure server, whether it can be on a Google Drive, whether it's on a, you know, campus server, et cetera. Um, so a lot of the challenges that we have in higher education First and foremost, of course, is budget. And I know we all struggle with that. Um, we have some some vagaries that, that come around for various things. So, you know, we had uh, for years at, at Humboldt, we had uh, on-prem storage for everything, for our teaching needs, our research needs, our, our static data that our students accessed for projects and things like that. And then Google came along and said, hey, universities, we will give you a huge chunk of data, have fun with it. And so we moved a lot of stuff to Google uh, which reduced the need for our um, on-prem maintenance 
which our IT department was very happy about. But now Google has come back and said, no, in fact, we're going to cap your storage. And now we've got to go through this whole transition of uh, getting everybody back down under the data caps. Um, they they gave us a number. Uh, they said maybe they were thinking for geospatial faculty, we could have 100 gigabytes of space. And, and I just cried because I'm over three times that right now. Um, so all of that stuff changes all the time. We have use constraints. Some things are licensed for educational use, but then that means that we can't use it for research, right? Or maybe it's for a specific project. We've collected it for a project under a specific grant, and then we can't bring it back into the classroom and use it for things like that. Um, faculty transition, as new faculty come in with expectations from wherever they were before, they want different things from uh, the way we store our data or the type of data we store and, and how IT allows us to access it. Uh, as our students graduate and move on, how do we uh, how do we allow them to take their data and their projects with them? Um, you know, that's something, you know, Google Drive allowed us to do a lot of that very easily, but we'll have to think about that as we move forward. And of course, if it is protected data, then the whole, the whole equation changes. Uh, and then IT policies. Of course, we have a, um, Isabella mentioned steering committees. We have a steering committee. Uh, we have an IT, geospatial IT working group that we get together and we talk with our on-campus IT folks. But even so, as their policies change, or as I mentioned, the Google Drive example changes, um, our, we're part of the California state system, which is the largest university system in North America. They issue edicts that affect how we store stuff. Um, there might be statewide policy changes, right? This I've taught in multiple states and the, the policies are different in each state about how we do this stuff. So every time those change, then of course we have to come back and, and revisit this whole process because we are not the only decision makers in this equation. So how do we support all this in higher ed? Um, as institutions, of course, we try to curate as many best practices as we can. Um, UCGIS helps support some of that. I'll show you an example here in a minute. Um, we have the uh, GIS and T body of knowledge that we maintain that has uh, peer reviewed pieces and, and uh, articles and tutorials and things all in it. Um, we try to educate stakeholders as much as possible. We recommend steering groups, uh, advisory groups. Most, um, most community colleges and some four-year institutions will have an advisory group that consists of faculty members and then outside GIS professionals uh, and then also administration. <clears throat> um, you know, we put together white papers and webinars to help educate like, like this webinar here. Um, we can do case studies. We also love to hear those things. So UCGIS, we also try to foster a lot of industry academic partnerships so that we're learning from industry what their best practices are and how can we translate that stuff. Uh, I think a couple of the presenters after me are going to talk a little more about some of those practices and, and, and the GSPIT collaboration thing. Um, this collaborative planning is huge. Uh, you know, we had an example. Um, I was working on a, on a project with uh, some researchers at the University of Alabama they changed their policies on data storage and suddenly we lost access to uh, just an absolute ton of data. Uh, we have, you know, we had to scramble and work with their IT and our IT and, and get it all together and get it from a backup and, and restore it because they had changed their storage policies. So a lot of that just requires communication and, and conversation. Uh, you know, the, the one of our local communities has a two terabyte LIDAR file that they would love for us to store because they're not going to provide it on their website, but they want our students to play with it. And our IT department freaked out when we said we want one file that's two terabytes. So just, you know, being open and communicating and, and keeping those conversations flowing about the, the needs and the changes and things like that. Um, so just quickly before I'm done here, I wanted to uh, show you all this this website. So this is the gis &T body of knowledge. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a sort of a peer reviewed piece um, and it's interactive and it's dynamic and it grows and it changes. It's, it's a living document for sure. But I just really quick typed in governance here and you can see the, the URL here in the corner for you. I typed in governance and it gives me a topic on governance and agency and I can click view and I can drill down into that. Uh, it shows me that it's part of the larger topic of GIST and society. Um, so these are all linked together, connected. Uh, interactive and all of that stuff. So that's a great place uh, where you can look up some of this stuff. Like I said, we also enjoy collaborating with industry on webinars and, and white papers and things like that. So that's all I've got for you. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate your perspective, especially from a higher education 
and all the challenges that you uh, have experienced. I think that all helps give us some insight to what you are dealing with. So thank you so much. All right, well, next up we have Jarrell. You wanna share your slides and There we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Awesome, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Jarrell Brown and we're touching on data governance and what it means to the Henry Ford um, as a non-for-profit. Um, for those who are not familiar, we are in Dearborn, Michigan, right outside of Detroit, considered Metro Detroit. And we're a, a hands-on cultural destination in addition to a ninth through 12th charter academy on 200 acres of land and having about 26 million collection artifacts and items and growing, um, we can't stop acquiring. Um, you know, and so the one thing I wanna say here is it's not unusual for a cultural institution to adopt GIS and leverage the data governance, but it has been very beneficial to us um, as we attempt to be a leader in the space, building on our analytics, business intelligence, and adding GIS as a stack. Um, so it has to complement. So a lot of themes um, and terms and principles that everyone mentioned prior to me are consistent and really what we lean on and look towards um, in terms of building and growing our GIS strategy and team. Um, full disclosure, our team is a team of two, myself and a full-time GIS analyst, in addition to a paid intern through our diversity and equity internship program. We have that about 40 to 45 weeks a year, and we need that to support our growing needs and capabilities and to continue to be consistent um, with our GIS strategy and then how we govern, grow, maintain it. And so these are our six core businesses. As we mentioned, we're a cultural destination with about 1.6 million attendees every year. We run signature events that come from all over the Midwest area from attendees. We have a charter academy and we have a digital learning and virtual engagement environment, as well as very beautiful weddings convention events. So if you have an event or you're coming to an event in the area, um, stop by. But, you know, data governance, we've already had to implement it um, in the six years I've been here and um, in the development of our IT team. Um, but, you know, it, it really comes down to justifying the need of how GIS and governance is applied from um, across all the core businesses um, by looking at the systems, the data, and then the resources that we'll have. And we do this and we govern, and this is how we justified it as it relates to our um, strategic goals and our future sustainability, of, allows us to develop capabilities and functions with identifying the three key ones, and then always having space for future ideas and innovation. Um, one key term that we're going to say is flexible and nimble as it relates to the Henry Ford and as we're learning um, and growing because things change at such a remarkable pace. Now, as it relates to all these governing systems, we have to put them through a central unit, um, enterprise resource management as it relates to capabilities, a hub, that processes and cleans the data. So, you know, one entry point, multiple entry points out. Um, there is a loop not shown in this, but I thought for this visual and this um, conversation, we could keep it simple with just showing how it processes through to capabilities. And we can't do that consistently on, on, and aligned without data governance, without looking at the audience that's going to be leveraging the GIS data, the cadence that we need it at as a cultural institution, a destination and a mission fit organization, and what collaboration do we have to have? 
So there's, you know, these principles that I've mentioned prior, but at the end of the day, these are all complementary aspects to how we manage our organization in addition to other organizations. Um, we, it was key to identify the roles of each core business, the role of each data source that we showed prior, and then the impact it has on the four bubbles that you might have seen, and then the impact we may have for the future. But this is all aimed at aligning. I think um, we had seen that there should be executive championing, um, there should be strategic um, prioritization of GIS and data governance into the institution. And, you know, we would second that because since then we've been able to grow in the projects and some of the services that we've been able to offer as a mission fit organization. So I like this picture. This is um, the human tower competition in Spain, I believe, but you know, it's integral that you have to work together or else these things will fall. Um, you know, you will lose some of the trust that we said that was, um, as some of my colleagues mentioned earlier, um, you will have to communicate, you have to develop a plan and a strategy, maybe a wider base from the bottom, and then you really execute. And what is the tippy top of Mount Everest or this tower look like? Um, you know, and I think that will help level set expectations, which is what we have done here at the Henry Ford. Um, because we've, you know, released some fun projects that get everyone thinking about GIS and how we're growing and how we're leveraging it. I have not been in that tower before, but I hope to one day. So as a culture institution and non-for-profit, you know, we do want to make sure that we're focusing on mission. Um, one of our mission projects are the Innovation Atlas, where we take several sources um, from census or public data sets that are could be um, replicable, in addition to providing gateways and journeys for access to this data. Um, we have community outreach teams, about 120 organizations here in Metro Detroit that aren't GIS people or users, let alone have an analytics division and team. Um, so that's one way um, we brought in and think about audiences and cadence. And then we bring in food sustainability, really leveraging public sources so that we can um, bring in the same governance and standards as some of those and the governance and standards of some of the partners um, that you may keep partnerships with their data as well. Now, the Innovation Atlas, this was an interactive map of the United States, and we partnered with the Department of Education, the Patent Office, Trademark Office, and a few other agencies to really leverage validated research. So we've had to create partnerships and think about audiences of educators. And the cadence of that is whenever that data gets updated, we get updated. Um, so it's really a consistency and it goes back to those pillars earlier of ongoing rigor. Um, you, can, you can't just set it and forget it. Um, Helping with that, we have found is creating key partnerships and collaborations. So we see these partners once or twice a year so that we can build that communication so that when they know something changes, we know very soon as well. We do data walks as well, you know, to really bring community members into this data field, um, interactive ways for residents, researchers to learn about data and then learning their use case. That helps us build our governance strategy as we talk about the audiences and the cadence and the type of partnerships and outcomes we want out of these. They also help us continue to build that trust and collaboration as we're growing through our key business units. This is a data walk where we go in, we educate um, our THF staff here we did yesterday or our community partners and, um, you know, educate what data is to them, educate what GIS is, and then how can we build something for the sustainability. And then again, we build impact stories, you know, again, and without the structure of permission-based security that as we was mentioning earlier, um, industry standards that we see from this great community and ecosystem, um, we're not able to duplicate and help support, you know, this industry 
but these are just some of the ways where we truly just think about, again, audience, cadence, and collaboration. So I'll wrap it up with it has trickled now into our core business where we get into a little bit of that primary data, secondary data, passive data, demographic data. Um, so it's very important that this is, you know, a different lens of data governance. And, you know, to be honest, we are still building this, um, building the car as we drive it, we like to say here at the Henry Ford, but it's bringing on another nimble future innovative idea and concept for how we're managing GIS um, at the Henry Ford. Thank you, Jarrell. Uh, really great perspective from a non-for-profit and, and definitely curator of much, many data, many pieces. Um, so thank you for your perspective and really appreciate uh, your graphics were great. I love that tower, human tower. That is how it feels, is you need everyone to support you and, and hold you up. So thank you so much. All right, so now we're gonna kick it on over to Paul Giraud. Paul, uh, you ready to share your slides? I'm here and here we go. Share the right ones, perfect. Okay, um, we're good. You can see my slides, perfect. Um, here it is. So I'm Paul Giroux. Thanks for uh, first inviting me to this and also for um, listening. We have a bunch of attendees still here, so that's great. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, some geodata governance, just like the rest of us, but a different perspective on things. So, um, you know, to do some research on this and even day to day at work, um, I Googled this. I, I Googled, I used chat GPT. Um, I looked at McKinsey articles, but essentially we're here to learn what some best practices are. Let me talk about why I'm here briefly. So why am I here? Um, you, as you can see from the introduction, I have an identity crisis. And so Trisha just introduced some of my fun passion project stuff. Essentially, I'm just like you daytime. I lead innovation, business and locational intelligence with a very small team. So Kara asked the question about governance with small teams so we can reach out and talk to each other after. Um, and we use an open data stack, Elastic, Cabana, we do really cool things there. And of course we use the Esri ecosystem uh, on our GIS end. Nighttime, my fun time, my passion is I'm not in the choir, but um, my passion project is basically maturity. And so I studied a problem I had trying to implement enterprise GIS. And so we did every best practice imaginable. Nothing was working, right? And um, from that grew Slim Jim, which you may have heard, it's just the enterprise maturity model. And that since has grown and expanded and there's variants and it's in a rare Arabic. And it's interesting where that project has gone, but I'm not a consultant. I'm not chasing a dollar. I'm just trying to empower leaders uh, with a better way to do strategy because my ultimate purpose in life, I think, is to disrupt how we do enterprise strategic um, planning, right? I don't think uh, it's relevant anymore. So in terms of data governance, let's go and look back a little bit. So the warm hug of data governance, the list of things we should be doing, the best practices that we're learning today, there's something else that's happening in the background, right? There's something a little bit more sinister. And that's the thing that I have the most passion with. I get a lot of angst from it but I'm um, adversity fueled. So um, we're running into data issues, even with the best governance, um, data governance, even with uh, IT governance, so on and so forth. We're having issues, everyone's having issues uh, with data, right? Our data is not where we want it to be. Um, and so I'm here because for the past decade, since I've come up with the model, basically I'm helping peers model what their actual enterprise maturity is. And I've been helping them align to reality and then perform. So that I've been doing on lunch with peers. There's really, really good group of peers. Isabella is one of them. She's uh, she's a rock star when it comes to maturity and she's been using it for a long time. And so the issue that we have then um, is how do we understand these, let's call them ghouls in the back. So for me, it's like, that's the head, the heart and the body, okay? and 
for me, with the um, approach we've taken is we use a model. So now there's a new one, Slim DNA, so data and analytics, which is just a variant, a small twist on the Slim Jim model, which is an enterprise geospatial model. And it allows organizations to actually measure um, their health, their impact on data quality, right? So this was the beast that was written way back in the day that it all stemmed from. And it studied that issue is there's ghouls here that we have to deal with, right? It's groups of people, it's our capabilities and stuff. And so it stems from enterprise data and that's where the model's a little different. I came at it from the data enterprise data perspective. Um, and then we just kind of gave it the geo flair to it. So it wasn't a very GIS myopic model. It's a very data centric enterprise model, okay? And the head, so to speak, is your leadership like the mindset, right? The culture. And those are really important because are you trying to do put data governance um, in practice in an organization that you just don't have the right support for? Well, the odds are stacked against you, right? The other one is, and the heart, what I call is, is process orientation. So this is the thing that pumps your data. This is the most important part is the process orientation. So again, you could have good leadership and they're saying, hey, everyone, get on board with data. We're making data-driven decisions. Use GIS to guide us strategically moving forward. But if the processes in the organization are not well-documented, centralized, so on and so forth, it's going to be a tire fire, right? It's going to be really hard to manage your data if you don't have custodianship set up. No one understands their roles, responsibilities. No one's participating in stuff. And then finally, is kind of the body. This is more of your capabilities itself. Can you sustain an enterprise uh, GIS or enterprise data and analytics program? And do you have the right foundational data and technologies, right? Are you modern? Are you current? Are you integrating? Um, do you have the right um, actual administration to do that kind of stuff? So Deep Key had mentioned the holistic enterprise. Well, we can, we've, you know, you can Google stuff like I've done. ChatGPT will give you answers. Great to have a bunch of checklists of items of things we should do. Our group of peers, we like measures. We want, we like results, right? We want to find answers. And that's where the model is really, really important is it gives you a true holistic enterprise thing, not just a laundry list of tasks you should do or some really in, good insights you get from an article, right? So I'm going to show you really quickly so you understand what I'm talking about, these factors. And then you can tie this back to everything that everybody's already talked about and just imagine these have a measure to it, right? Like from one to five, okay? So I'm gonna flip over here, so just bear with me. Just to go through, and I'm gonna rip through them really quick, so I apologize, but um, this will be uh, released shortly, this model. It's in use now in places like City of Barrie, Hampton uses it. Um, it was uh, developed out of oil and gas, okay? Long story short. So f success factors, okay? So the original Slim Jim model, uh, hopefully you can see that okay. Let me boost that a little bit. But I'm going to read a couple of for you. So GIS data promoted by leadership, formal GIS governance is established, senior management learning. Okay. What I want to show you is the data and analytics because it's data and analytics promoted, formal data analytics governance established. It's the same factors. Okay. Slim Jim, even though it's GIS specific, it was designed for enterprise data. And so I'll go through and read some of these. Um, so you have an understanding that if you measure these success factors, you actually start understanding how you can actually start targeting improvements in your organization, things you have to start to implement, right? So you can actually have a good quality um, data practice. So things like formal data and analytics governance, uh, the senior management's learning about this stuff, because if they're not, are you going to get by, right? The departments, are they cooperating? Are they getting rid of helping you get rid of uh, duplicative efforts. Uh, are your projects aligned with a vision? And these are from oil, the oil and gas company is, do you have a data literacy uh, program? And is it value of data evangelicized? That was important, right? Uh, enterprise strategies are all aligned and uh, we can go on and on, but now we're getting into more of the heart, which is like your customers trust the integrity of your data, your staff are process minded and they value process, your goals are shared across. Um, silos, your process documentation is standardized and central. It goes on and on. These are just the data specific factors. So if you look at the model, 
this will be a really indication, really good indication of where you are now and how well you're going to do when you're going to start implementing the recommendations of the panel. So we'll go back to the slides here because I'm running out of time. I swore I didn't want to see red, Tricia. So, um, okay, so be honest, be practical, and be real. This is really important. I work in a, in a small utility, and so we have to do, do scrappy governance. We have to not govern with a bunch of best practices. We just don't have um, the cycles to do it. So you all have organizational health issues that impact uh, data governance. So be honest. But institute change in the context of your reality. A model would be good. Okay, I'm partial to Slim Jim, obviously, but there are other great models out there. Um, and then just build data governance muscle. Start small where you're going to have the best and the most impact and you're going to get success and start building and use the model iteratively to move you forward. So nuggets, Trisha asked for some nuggets of knowledge. One is just align your data governance effort to the actual reality of your organization, right? Um, two is adopt a really good enterprise maturity model. So something that's gonna look at enterprise data and really go from the top of your organization down through so you can see all the real problems and then be pragmatic and strategic, right? So just strategy, big strategies, those are gone now, like focused roadmaps, get on it and then just be pr really practical, uh, practical about it. And so that's it. I was trying to get it in on 10. Um, at 10 minutes and 16 seconds, I went over. Um, and this is how you get a hold of me, best ways, LinkedIn. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Paul Giroux. And uh, next up, we have Nathan. Uh, Nathan, you want to go ahead and share? Sure. Thanks, Tricia. Um, so, uh, uh, my name is Nathan Hayeswood, and I am from Auckland, New Zealand, which um, on the US uh, template slides that they sent out to me, um, New Zealand is not actually on, on the map, which we are a bit used to, but um, hey, US, uh, we're down here. So um, yeah, uh, <laughs> we, get a, we get that a lot. Um, so I have the honor of kind of wrapping up the session today um, and some of the things which um, URSA are interested in is um, taking a look at the bigger picture and, and thinking about, um, you know, data governance is only one small component of the overall governance of uh, geographic information systems. So um, there's going to be a questionnaire which is coming out um, after my talk, um, which is looking at some of those wider uh, things which you all might like to um, discuss more about other factors of governance in the future. So this is a model that we have developed at Eagle for looking at the high level responsibilities of geospatial governance. Uh, and we, some of the other speakers have already covered some of the aspects of this, which are, are mostly related to the gov uh, data governance aspects. Uh, and I'm going to focus on uh, another aspect of um, this model, which is um, understanding the special characteristics of uh, GIS and making sure that those are taken into consideration when it comes to governance. So we all know that uh, GIS is part of IT, um, but we're not exactly the same. Uh, so because um, there are differences between GIS and the rest of uh, general IT, Sometimes that can cause conflict. So sometimes um, a GIS manager, for example, often GIS, GIS teams sit under IT and um, sometimes the IT managers don't quite get GIS. And um, so this can cause you know, GIS managers to, to have difficult conversations with IT managers. And um, so really what we need to try and do is to make sure that actually we're all on the same team and um, we need to understand what it is that the IT managers need from us and we need to be able to communicate to the uh, IT managers what's important from a GIS perspective. So that's what my um, talk today is about, trying to identify some of those factors which need to be considered 
and thinking about some tools to aid with um, uh, communication between GIS and IT. Maybe some of you um, recognize uh, these particular types of problems. It's so one of the big problems, um, as Dina mentioned um, and deeply mentioned at the start of the session, uh, GIS is really a system of systems. Um, it's partly a system of record, it's partly a system of engagement, it's partly a system of analysis. Um, and so it's quite different in that way to a lot of other systems. So um, SAP, for example, is very much a system of record. Um, and if you want to make changes to SAP, then you need to go through a lot of governance and change control and all of those kinds of things, whereas Excel is a system of analysis. And so, you know, to make, for somebody to make changes to an Excel file that they have and to do some analysis with it, you don't need to go through a lot of change control to do that. So because GIS is um, this multiple different types of systems, we need to specify which parts of governance are appropriate for GIS when it's being used as a system of record and differentiate that to when it's being used as a system of analysis. So some of the other ways to think about um, differenti differentiation in terms of data governance is that quite often uh, GIS data is a lot more varied than the data that is used in other systems. So we need to understand the characteristics of each data set and uh, the data quality considerations and those types of things and the different types of um, data which we can use, even for something as simple as street addresses. Um, so, you know, postal addresses can quite often be different to business addresses or planned addresses or exceptional addresses. Um, so that's one key difference between GIS and other types of systems. Another thing which is very different uh, for GIS to other types of systems is that we tend to use a lot of data from external organizations. So you know, how many other types of systems can you say, hey, last Wednesday I went to the NASA open data site and downloaded some satellite data and I'm putting it into my GIS and I'm gonna do some analysis and it's gonna be great. And you know, other systems don't do that kind of thing. So in that way, um, GIS is quite unique. Another um, key difference between GIS and other types of systems is we deal with a lot of big data. So if you think about um, LiDAR point clouds or satellite imagery, you know, some of those things can be really massive data sets um, compared to your normal text and numbers types of databases. Also, we deal with a whole lot of different um, data types. And so, um, you know, understanding the differences and the strengths and weaknesses of all of these data types, um, you know, a lot of other types of systems are just dealing with you know, ASCII text in, um, in particular uh, XML formats and that kind of thing, which we need to do as well, but we also need to be able to accommodate a whole lot of other different types of data. Another key topic for um, governance is monitoring the evolution of technology. So um, these are some of the high level uh, areas of evolving technology which are relevant to GIS, which I've put into that grid there. I know there isn't time to sort of look at the details of all of that in the session today, but you can take the slide away after this and um, look at how uh, your organization might be wanting to grow and adapt into some of these um, areas of advancing technology, many of which are relevant to, uh, to data governance. Of course, a key strength of GIS is integration with other systems. And this is uh, you know, important from a data governance perspective to understand the nature of the data in those other systems and making sure that things happen like um, somebody doesn't make a change somewhere which is going to affect your um, GIS implementation or vice versa, if you're publishing services and things and you decide to change a, a field name or, or ch change data details of your data, you need to be sure that um, understanding what the integrations are which are using your data. There's also specialist concepts which are unique to GIS, which we all understand as GIS professionals, but a lot of other people don't understand. So things like um, map projections and coordinate systems and um, the conversions between those and the losses of data accuracy, when you do that kind of thing, you know, it's really only us GIS specialists who understand that. So we need to be able to communicate that to other users. One key strength of uh, GIS personnel is that we tend to understand the risks of using different uh, GIS data sets a lot better than other people. 
So you're not understanding that, um, what data is going to be used for. And if you have a data set of things like um, underground electricity cables, then understanding how accurate that data is and whether it can be used for certain purposes like digging, um, you know, that's a really important risk for um, which we understand, but a lot of other users don't understand. So that's a really key governance issue. We also tend to do a lot of um, data sharing and have arrangements with a lot of our colleagues and other agencies. And this is, a, again, something which is quite unique to GIS. And we also need to understand um, from a governance perspective, supporting our staff and our people, our GIS people, we tend to have some characteristics which are a bit different to other IT professionals. So a lot of GIS people, we've come from a ge geographic background and we're quite interested in, in environmental issues and saving the planet and those kinds of things, and also in social inter interests and volunteering. So I've uh, summarized um, all of these concepts in a, in a page which you can take away, or there's a QR code there to go to an article which will give you some more detail. Just to wrap things up, uh, a couple of events coming up if you're interested in these um, GIS management or governance or leadership uh, topics. Um, at the ESRI UC this year, there's the um, GIS Managers Summit, which is on the Sunday before the main conference. Um, so if you want to attend that session, a lot of the speakers today uh, will be speaking again at that conference. Um, so there's some details of that there, but book your flights a day early to come along on the Sunday. And also um, just like to give a really big plug for the uh, URSA GIS uh, Leadership Academy, um, which covered a lot of um, these topics today in a, a great deal of detail. Um, I attended in Santa Rosa a couple of years ago, and that's a fantastic uh, offering from URSA. So uh, make sure to look out for the next sessions of that. And that uh, is everything from me. Thank you, everyone. And um, hope you've enjoyed um, today's session. I'll hand you back to Tricia. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, please, everyone, if you can use your reactions to give a round of applause to all the panelists or hearts or whatever you think is, is best. We're now gonna go into, uh, it's 422. We're gonna go into questions. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q and A. Uh, I have, uh, Danielle, have you seen any questions? I think there is one for it's Pete, one. Um, if Pete's able to respond, and that was from Kara Atta, who said that, uh, who wants to know about, um, I'll read it out, it's hard to find straightforward ways to actually score or rate simple polygon data sets for quality and accuracy. How do you report it and what unit of measurement? Do you have any formulas or tools to be able to help with that, Pete? Yeah, actually, uh, I don't know if Kara is still on. I just got an email from her. I know her very well. And I, I sent an email back to her, but I, basically I said answering that question is pretty involved. It would take some time. But the, the first part of that is um, you know, identifying what quality parameters about those parcels are important to track and then figure out, figuring out what level of quality for each of those parameters you need to be concerned with. And then establishing quantitative measures, if possible, like 99.5% uh, accuracy, you know, attribute accuracy, and you can do the same kind of thing with positional accuracy, you know, and then come the processes and methods and tools that you use to check quality, w whether you're doing, you know, a major data collection effort of parcels or just updating, you know, an, an existing parcel data set. There are some commercial products out there like the Esri Data Reviewer that can help, um, you know, some in-house tools. And again, the manual checking process, which could in some cases mean going out in the field and doing some uh, checks, particularly for um, you know, positional accuracy. So, Kara, you know how to get in touch with me. If you want to explore that a little bit more, um, let me know. We can talk. Does anyone else on the panel have an example that they'd like to use to also answer that question from Kara? Uh, it's just one tool that might be a bit useful is the um, Data, Data Management Association Dharma Dimbok, which is the um, data management body of knowledge. Um, that's It's very general IT 
um, resource, so it's, it's not really specific to GIS, but it does provide a useful list of some of the criteria that you can use to assess data quality. Um, so there's things like timeliness, uh, spatial accuracy, attribute, attribute accuracy, um, fitness for purpose. Um, there's quite a useful list of headings in there that you can at least think about, right, these are the things which I need to test for. And then as Pete said, you know, develop the specific test for that specific um, criteria of the data that you want to look at. Excellent. Anyone else from the panel want to share any experience that they've had with a similar situation? All right. Uh, let's see if we have some more questions. I just see, I just see Kara's. Oh, here we go. James Holloway, what are your thoughts? Here we go. What are your thoughts about GIS being used more and more with digital engineering technology? Collaborating and sharing data between GIS and digital design teams. Digital engineering engineering have their own information management standards. How does that align with geo governance? Who would like to take that? Go ahead and unmute. Thank you, James, for your question. Tricia, um, I can take a quick uh, stab at it. We do quite a bit of work with architecture engineering um, construction firms. And as you think about the uh, geoengineering and as things are moving more and more digital, it is really important to establish those data standards for the exchange. And then also, um, as we all know, uh, for certain aspects of, of any businesses, whether it's an AEC or government, government, sometimes the primary system is not necessarily GIS. So I would encourage people to very much fold uh, the GIS aspects into their typical workflow and also where it makes sense, use GIS as that data exchange. We often call location the foreign key, right? And in many cases, when, um, especially when doing work amongst a whole group of vendors, third parties, partners, it is extremely important to set up the data standards and the data exchange mechanisms in a way that can be governed that avoids uh, duplication and it makes it very clear as you're moving an engineering project forward or as you're moving to say all the way to a digital transformation, it makes every step of the journey and provides clarity and avoids a lot of the frustrations that people are going to face otherwise. Thank you. Trisha, I've got uh, just one more comment on that. It's it's not really an answer to the question, but I'll point out one issue that comes up when you're looking at um, bringing uh, civil engineering data into GIS. Now, software tools, you know, particularly Esri and others, have done some pretty nice things with integrating the data. But one of the problems that I've seen is that many times that engineering data, that geo design data, CAD data, whatever you want to call it. Um, does not have spatial coordinates. It's sort of like in this particular project area, the earth is flat. So immediately bringing it into a GIS, if you need to do that, and that's of course happening now, it's figuring out the best way to apply um, uh, coordinates, spatial coordinates to that with an appropriate projection. And that can get a little crazy when you're going from the flat earth environment to a projected environment. So and there, there are tools for that. There's one issue to, you know, keep in mind in that sort of uh, environment. Thank you, Pete. It is 429. Um, I'm going to have Danielle go ahead and put the survey up. And just wanted to say a huge thank you to Dina, Deepti, to Isabel, to Paul, to Pete, to Jarrell, to Amy, to Nathan. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you all to the, the audience for hanging out with us. I do have a couple slides I'd like to share if uh, everybody can kind of hang on or just some things coming up with ERISA that I wanna make sure everybody's aware of. 
we have um, we have the upcoming webinars, ERISA Climate and Community Resilience Webinar Series, AI and Emergency Management, GIS Workflow for Urban Heat Mapping, the Role of GIS in Flood Hazard Identification and Analysis and Solutions. And then next we have the URSA Excellent in GIS webinar series. We've got King County, Washington coming up, King County Smart Building Management System, as well as Pulaski Area Geographic Information System in Arkansas. That's PAGES Damage Assessment and Emergency Response Program. And then of course, we'll have Cuyahoga County, Ohio, Cuyahoga County Fiscal GIS Hub. We also have the uh, Cal GIS coming up next week. So I hope you guys are registered. We got the GIS uh, Evaluation Technologies Conference. That's in April. Then you'll see uh, GIS leadership like Nathan plugged uh, in Seattle, Washington in June. And then we'll have another one in Fort Worth, Texas. Then you have to absolutely mark your calendars for the 62nd, 62nd GIS Pro. And that's in Portland, Maine in October uh, 7 through 10. And hopefully everyone can make that. Uh, thank you all. And we will have some surveys going out and some slides going out. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day. I uh, appreciate you all. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks everyone. <clears throat>